gentle listener, and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, the fortnightly podcast that brings you dark tales performed by voice artist Kristen Holland. As regular consumers of the show will know, we make it a practice to feature horrific tales of dread and unease from both classic long-revered masters and fresh, exciting, contemporary wordsmiths. This episode, we're very pleased to be sharing with you an offering from one of our esteemed listeners, who certainly falls within the latter category. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present a work from our new friend, Joe Palumbo, The Gravesman. No one could have known or even guessed that the most important person in Stern, Texas, was the man who lived in a small broken-down house adjacent to the Stern Cemetery. To the citizens of this small Texas town, he was simply a quiet old man who spent his days grooming and maintaining the long-forgotten necropolis. Every morning he would open the large metal gates and then go about his business of pulling weeds, adjusting the faded headstones, and fixing even the smallest issues with the iron fence that surrounded the property. With clockwork timing, he would then shut and securely lock the gates at dusk, every day, without fail. No one really understood why he was so committed to this task. There hadn't been a burial in the cemetery since the death of Sheriff Hargrove in 1952, and most of the people who were even related to any of the dead there had either died themselves and been buried elsewhere or had left Stern long ago. However, none of the people seemed to mind. And why would they? He wasn't hurting anything, and he had been taking care of the place for over sixty years. Occasionally, someone would see him in Bull's Hardware or maybe at the Chow Line Diner and ask him why. Oh, you know, Andy Morris would say with a chuckle, Even the dead deserve a nice place to be. He would then smile and walk away, leaving the inquirer puzzled. So everyone just left the old man alone, and he quickly acquired a reputation for being a kind and quiet man, although a little odd. So Andy kept to himself, with one exception, Sam Keaton, the owner and operator of the local bar, aptly named Sam's. After Andy closed and locked the gates of the cemetery, he would often go to the small bar, which catered to mostly local farmers or truckers passing through, and sit in the same seat at the end of the bar, drink and talk the evening away with Sam. Andy took a great liking to Sam, and had told him on more than one occasion that Sam was the smartest man in Stern and an all-around stand-up guy. Sam assumed that Andy really did think that, but also assumed that the occasional free drink helped that opinion of Andy's. Sam had brought that up to him, and Andy had dismissed the idea with a flick of one wrinkled hand. That's not it at all. Look at you. You don't let this world get you down, despite what some say about your kind. Andy gestured towards Sam's black skin. Those people who say stuff like that are... Idiots, I tell you. You kept this little bar going and found your piece of happiness. And I respect that. Sam simply smiled and patted Andy on his thin shoulder. He then refilled Andy's whiskey glass and said, This one's on the house, Andy. He capped the bottle and said, leaning on the bar, You have done the same, you know, taking care of that place all these years. How long has it been since you started doing that? 
Andy scratched the back of his head, as if the answer was just under his scalp, and said, I started in 1973. I was just 22 years old then. Just a dumb kid who made a promise. To your wife? Is she buried there? Sam asked, surprised at Andy's candor about the cemetery. No, he said quietly. Nancy died in 1976. Damn cancer was bad enough without burying her there. She was cremated and her ashes scattered on the Red River. I wouldn't do something as horrible as put her in that place. She was a good woman. She was the best woman. What promise did you make, Andy? You know, I'm 70 years old, and I doubt I have many more years left. I don't mind. Maybe I will see her in heaven. I know she is there. It's me I have my doubts about. I killed a lot of men in that jungle. I guess taking care of that godforsaken place is pittance enough for that. Andy was staring into his drink with a blank look. Sam was certain that whatever he was seeing, it was not his whiskey. Andy let out a sigh, and with one swallow, he finished his drink. Without being asked, Sam refilled the glass. He debated on asking his question again, but Andy finished the fresh drink in one swallow and looked at Sam with bright and water-coated eyes. Ignore me, he said. I'm drunk and I am old. I also tend to babble, and I doubt I was making much sense. Andy then stood from the bar removed a crumpled twenty from his jean pocket and set it on the bar. Sam watched with a bemused smile as Andy stumbled towards the door. You're not good to drive. Let me get someone to drive you. I walked, Andy said, pulling the heavy wooden door open. It is a hell of a nice summer night. I enjoy the walk. Sam did not see Andy until two days later. Sam was just filling a second cup of coffee from behind the bar when he heard two knocks on the wooden door. He looked up at the neon clock above the bar and saw it was five after two in the afternoon and the bar would not be open for two more hours. He shrugged, walked around the bar and pulled the bolt for the door. There were no windows in the main room of the bar so the bright summer sunshine was sharp against Sam's eyes. He blinked several times until his vision cleared and saw Andy. Hey, buddy, Sam said with a smile. I'm not open yet. I just want to talk to you for a minute, Andy said quietly. Sam gave a nod and stepped clear of the door, saying... I just put on a pot of coffee. You take yours like a man, if I remember. As Andy stepped in, he laughed and nodded. Sam gestured towards one of the booths and headed behind the bar. As he filled a second mug full of black coffee, he watched Andy ease himself down on the red vinyl of the seat. Sam replaced the pot and carried the mugs to the booth. He set Andy's cup in front of him, and he smiled a silent thanks. So, what's on your mind, Andy? When did you move to Stern? Fifteen years ago, next month. After my divorce, I bought this place. I wanted a quiet place to live. I was raised here, but was born north in Harper. You know, 
This wasn't always such a quiet, nice town. It used to be rotten. That's the only way I can describe it. There were murders, rapes, beatings, and other things. Every place has dark things in its past, especially in America's West and past, Sam said over his mark. This place hasn't been like that since I've lived here. No, you're right about that. Sheriff Hargrove was the last person killed here. His own deputy shot him six times, not too far from this bar. He was killed just up the street. Andy gestured in the direction. I was real young when it happened. It was about that time that my daddy started taking care of the cemetery. He even built that fence and gate that still stands today. He started with the help of this minister or pastor that came to town soon after that last killing. He took care of that place till the day he died. Is that who you made the promise to? Sam asked, leaning forward. The other day you mentioned a promise. Did I ever tell you about how I got discharged and not a nam? Andy asked, as if answering Sam's question with another question. Sam shook his head. My unit was heading back from patrol. Where and when doesn't really matter. We had just come to this clearing when we were ambushed. It was so quiet just before, and then, boom, gunfire started coming from all sides. We were falling back to the tree line, attempting to put up a defensive line when we heard the chopper that was sent to pick us up coming in. We had to get through, because the chopper wasn't going to wait around forever in hostile area. Our CO was on the radio with command. He then shouted for everyone to pull back. We were going ahead to an alternative pickup spot. That was easier said than done, because they were attempting to surround us. I looked up and spot a grenade flying through the air. Now, next to me was this private. His name was Parker. It was Private Lewis Parker. He was this minor league baseball player from upstate New York. He was actually going to play for the Yankees when he got back. He was a pitcher, and a damn good one. He spotted the grenade, too, and caught it just before it hit the ground. He then pulled back like he was throwing the first pitch at the big game, and threw it back. That grenade didn't arch like before. It flew straight back at him. It detonated, killing two of them. If Parker hadn't caught it and thrown it back, it would have either killed me or ruined my day. This other grenade starts coming at us. And just like before, it is heading right for me. I get ready to grab it and throw it back, but Lewis beats me to it. The damn thing hits the ground and he snatches it up. Whoever threw that grenade cooked it before letting it go. That means he held it for a couple of seconds longer before letting it go. A couple of seconds may not seem like much. But it can make the difference between a live man and a dead one. It exploded in his hand just as he pulled back to return it. It took off his right arm and part of the right side of his head. In this red mist, the blast threw me back and pumped shrapnel in the belly of this Irish kid named Murphy. 
We get the order to move out, and I grab Murphy by the collar and start to drag him with us, all the while firing back with my other hand. After what felt like I'd been dragging this bleeding, screaming kid forever, I hear someone yell that we're there. I turn and look, and I can see the chopper hanging just above the ground. Then I feel this impact, like someone punched me twice in my lower and upper back. And as I fall to the ground, all I can think is that's it for me and Murphy. But then I feel hands grabbing at us both and pulling us in the chopper. I'm man enough to admit that I blacked out soon after that. When I came to, I was in a field hospital. This captain came by and gave me a Purple Heart medal, among others, and tells me I was shot twice in the back. Would have been three times, but that first shot caught Murphy in the head. He tells me he's sorry. And I think he's sorry for Murphy. But I find out that I am bleeding internally. And the doctors can't stop it. I'm going to die in that hospital. They give me stuff for the pain and I'm out again. I walk later that night and standing at the foot of my bed is this man. He's wearing all black and a wide brim felt hat. He has dark glasses hanging from his breast pocket and he's looking down at me with gray eyes. He looks like one of those fire and brimstone pastors. And for a second I think he's death coming to collect me personally. He pulls a chair up to the side of my bed. What you do to earn those medals, son? He asked me. I tell him I was shot trying to help someone. You like helping people, he asks. I just look away from those gray eyes. I didn't want this man around me. He frightened me. And I was tired. I just wanted to close my eyes and die sleeping. Then... The man reached out and grabbed my hand. His grip was hard and cold like hands made from stone. That touch brought me back from the haze in my mind. He leaned close and said, Your daddy is dead. He died two nights ago in his sleep. Your mama found him. She's not doing too good either. His eyes got very sharp as if he was trying to look into my soul. I was almost certain then that this man was death. He had taken my daddy... And now it was coming for me before taking my mama. Do you want to live, son? Do you want to get out of this place and go home? He asked. Tears came to my eyes and all I could do was nod. 
You see, Sam, I did want to live. And it was what I wanted most in that moment. I nodded again and tried to speak, but for some reason that to this day I don't know why, I couldn't say a single word. He then leaned even closer to me and squeezed my hand. I could smell him now. He had a strange odor that wasn't like anything I had ever smelled on anyone. It smelled like a bouquet of lilies and roses mixed with a strange, clean smell. It reminded me of the lobby of a funeral home. You're going to have to make me a promise, son. Will you promise me one thing? He whispered. I nodded. He then leaned close and whispered the promise in my ear. For a second... I didn't understand what he meant. But then it came to me. What was the promise? Sam asked quietly, not completely certain he wanted to know now. He asked me to promise to take over my daddy's work. He wanted me to be the graves man. Andy looked into Sam's eyes that were now narrowed into a look of uneasy confusion. Then Andy said, This man in black then slid his hands down to my stomach and pressed down. I could then feel cold spreading through my body. He then placed one hand over my eyes, and before I could even think, I was out like a light. I woke up the next day with the doctors standing around me. They were all smiling and telling me it was a miracle. The bleeding had stopped. And I was going home as soon as I was well enough. A few weeks after, I came home and took over where my father left off. I have never told anyone that story before. Not even my wife. Sam found that he was clutching his coffee mug tightly and had to force himself to loosen his grip. He tried to swallow, but his mouth and throat were completely dry. He lifted his mug up with hands that, to his surprise, were steady and took a drink. Why are you telling me this, Andy? Was it because I asked? That's part of it, but don't think you were prying or anything. See, I don't have anyone in Stern, or anywhere for that matter. I'm getting old and will die one day sooner than if I was a younger man. I've carried this with me for too long. Andy then finished his coffee and reached for his wallet. Sam stopped him with a raised hand. You didn't order that coffee. This wasn't a bartender and customer thing. This was friends sharing a cup of coffee. Andy nodded, leaned forward and patted Sam on the shoulder. He then stood from the booth and left. Sam sat for a long time, staring at the red vinyl of the bench across from him and tried to understand what he was just told. He then decided to place the entire conversation in a box in his mind and set that box on a dusty back shelf. Two months later, Andy Morris was dead. He was found one afternoon by a woman who was a stranger to Stern, she was lost and looking for directions when she spied Andy's home and the cemetery. She pulled down the gravel drive and saw him sprawled in front of the locked gates. 
A coroner from Harper determined the cause of death to have been a massive stroke, the same way his father died. The coroner also determined that Andy had died shortly before dawn, most likely just before he unlocked and opened the gates. Sam was one of only five people attending the funeral that was also held in Harper. All of the attendees were people who owned local businesses that Andy frequented. Sam wasn't surprised that Andy did not want a military funeral, but rather wanted his funeral to be quiet and for his remains to be cremated. What did surprise Sam was that Andy had left everything he owned to him and requested that he make the hour drive northeast to scatter his ashes in the same area of the Red River that his wife was scattered in. Sam didn't mind. The same day he spread Andy's ashes, he went to Andy's home. He stood in the small living room that smelt of stale air and old panelling. The room was dark, and Sam left the front door open to help the small light bulb overhead light the room. He was standing in front of a shelf above the television, looking at rows of old photographs and wondering what he was going to do with all of the possessions when a large shadow arched over him. Sam spun around in surprise and saw a tall man in black standing in the doorway. The man wore a black, wide-brim hat and silver-rimmed dark glasses. The lenses of the glasses were perfectly square, and reflected everything back. The man had his hands clasped together in front of his belt buckle and had a thin, soft smile. If you're looking for Andy, I'm afraid he's passed away, Sam said, taking a step towards the man. Yes, the man said. I am aware of Andy's passing. I'm sorry to say I was unable to attend his funeral. Were you a friend of Andy's? I did know him, yes. I'm Sam Keaton, Sam said, extending his hand. I own Sam's on Main Street. I am Warden. The man stepped closer to Sam, but opted not to shake. Mr. Keaton, would you be kind enough to take a walk with me? I wish to talk to you, and it is getting quite hot in here, wouldn't you say? Sam realized with some surprise that it was extremely warm in the small room. Sweat had broken out on his back and arms. He nodded, and Warden turned for the door. Stepping out in the early evening, Sam turned and admired the setting sun. The summer heat was giving way to a warm but pleasant night. He looked and saw a warden walking towards the cemetery. Sam followed him, and they both stopped at the gates. Mr. Keaton, how much of local history do you know? Not too much, Sam said. Andy is who told me most of what I know. Would you mind unlocking the gates? Do you know someone in there? I'm afraid I know them all, Warden said evenly. Sam fished the keys from his pocket and flipped through them. Each one was labelled by a tag made of masking tape and written on with black marker. As he fumbled through them, he took a side glance at this tall, pale man. The man continued to stare straight ahead. Sam found the key and unlocked the padlock that held the two halves of the gate. Warden stepped back, allowing Sam to pull the gate open. As he did, he glanced again at Warden and saw that the man had not removed his hands from their tight clasp at his belt. As soon as the gates were opened wide enough to allow a man in, Warden walked by Sam and entered the graveyard. Sam followed him with his eyes as Warden walked up the center gravel path. He then turned towards the west and looked down at a headstone that was facing south. 
Please, join me, sir, Warden said. Sam sighed uneasily and checked his pants pocket for his cell. It would be getting dark soon and he had no intentions of hanging around a cemetery at night with this man. He would end this bizarre conversation and get home. And if Warden attempted to stop him, he would get away from him and call the sheriff and get this ghoul of a man locked up. However, for the moment, he decided to hear Warden out. He walked down the same path until he was standing just a few feet from Warden. Earlier, Warden began, you said that Andy told you about local history. Rather, what you knew was from him. Yeah, I understand this used to be a pretty rough town. That is an understatement. Warden continued to stare down at the headstone as he spoke. There is something wrong with this place. It is much like a disease that seeps up from the ground. It's just an old cemetery, Sam said. Not the cemetery itself, Warden said with patience. This whole area... The cemetery is just a symptom of the disease. It's like a boil on the skin. As is the insanity that once gripped this land. He then turned to Sam and said, Do you know that every grave here houses a murderer, rapist or other degenerate? I do remember hearing something like that. The victims are also buried here as well. Many of those victims were consumed by this unseen cancer and created victims of their own. He then gestured towards the grave he had been looking at. This is Mary Baxter. In 1880 she drowned her only child in a wash basin in her home. That home is now the Stern Hotel. The child was ten months old. And when the father entered and saw what she had done, he strangled his wife in a fit of rage. He spent his life in a mental institution in Maine. Sam stepped off the path and looked down at the faded headstone. The name on it was Mary Baxter and next to it was a much smaller stone with the name Emma Baxter. Turning to Warden, Sam said, If you're trying to cheer me up after Andy's passing, it's not working. Warden gave Sam a thin smile and said, I am making a point. Please humor me for just a few minutes. He then turned and headed up the path. Sam debated just getting in his car and leaving. Instead, he stepped back on the path and followed Warden. The two stopped at another, slightly newer headstone. This is Hugo Waller. He was executed by hanging in 1905. He enjoyed praying on young women that happened to be passing through the town. He assumed that if he kept to those who did not live in town that no one would know. However, after he had finished with a young woman named Sarah Nelson, she managed to get away before he strangled her. From the time he was arrested by the local sheriff to the time he was hanging from the rope, two days had elapsed and that made it the shortest trial this town had ever known. This was life in Stern for a long time. Warden then headed for a headstone that was off the main path and in the far corner of the cemetery. This is the last person to be buried here. This is former Sheriff Wallace Hargrove. That one I do know. He was killed by his own deputy down by my bar. That is true. But do you know why? 
He looked at Sam, who said nothing. Hargrove believed that his wife had been killed, and her body taken over by a demon or spirit. He shot his wife in the head, and then cut her body up with a hatchet. She is buried in the next row over. Deputy Milton found him covered in blood and heading towards the bar for a drink. The deputy asked him what had happened, and Hargrove simply told the truth. Hargrove's teenage son had come home and discovered his mother in the tub. He screamed, as you can imagine one might. The home was very close to the bar, and with the window open in the stillness of the summer night, the scream was heard by Milton. He pulled his revolver on Hargrove. Hargrove then began to accuse Milton of being a demon too, and tried to go for his gun. Milton shot him six times. Sam's throat had gone dry. He swallowed and said, There isn't any homes that close to my bar. The home was sold a few years later. It was torn down, and I believe the library now sits there. Sam thought for a moment. The library was just north of his bar, and at the time many of the buildings between the back of the bar and the library were not there. He shook his head and glanced at the sun that was halfway down. You said you had a point to make. I am about to walk away, so I suggest you make your point. My point is... Warden said, stepping towards Sam. If you people knew what Andy was truly doing here, there would be a statue in his memory instead of a grey smear on the Red River and an old house filled with a forgotten life. It all stopped after Hargrove's death. It stopped when this fence was built, when those gates were erected, when the cancer was kept in. And he is now dead. You need to continue this. Keep the fence strong, keep those gates locked at night, open them in the morning to let the light in. You're crazy, Sam said through a mouth that felt like it was filled with sand. You act like you don't believe, and you tell yourself you don't. Why then have you stopped sweating, even though the day's heat still holds strong? Why is it? The longer we stand in this place, and the further the sun sets, you find it harder to breathe. Why do you feel this fear and rage? Sam was feeling all of this, and he hated it, and hated that this man knew he was. Sam's hands clenched into fists, and he said through gritted teeth, You need to leave. Get in your car. He pointed toward a black Lincoln that was parked near Sam's truck. And go! I better not see you again. Sam then turned and quickly walked away. Warden called out, Someone must keep it contained! Sam whirled round and shouted, why not you? I am unable, Warden said simply. Well, so am I. Sam then turned and left the cemetery, not bothering to close the gates behind him. Warden walked out of the cemetery and watched Sam shut and lock Andy's front door and climb in his truck. Sam then backed out and accelerated down the hill driveway, kicking up gravel. 
In the two weeks that followed, Sam stayed away from Andy's house and the cemetery. He kept his eye out for Warden, but had not seen him since his encounter with the stranger at Andy's house. Sam thought about Warden as he poured another drink. Something bothering you, Martin? Sam asked as he placed the glass of Jack down. Martin reached for the glass with trembling fingers. Sam could see Martin's hair was damp with sweat, despite the air conditioner running on Max. Martin looked up, and Sam could see dark rings under his eyes. There's nothing, he said. Talk to me, Martin, Sam said with a large, friendly smile. I'm cheaper than a shrink, and my medicines are a lot more enjoyable. I just haven't been sleeping. For the past week now, every night, I swear I'm hearing a woman calling for help in my backyard. It's very faint, but I can hear a woman's voice screaming for help. And then all I hear is her screaming stop. I've called the police twice now, and they never find anything. I've gone out there, and I haven't found anything. Maybe your neighbor has their TV up too loud, and you can hear it. I read somewhere that when we hear voices but can't really make out what they're saying, our mind tries to fill in the blanks. If you'd said that yesterday, I might have agreed with you. But not after the night. What happened then, Martin? I started to hear it again. I could hear her screaming. I wasn't going to sit another night and listen to this. It's been driving me up the damn wall. So I decided to leave and come here. I cut through the kitchen to get to the carport and I glanced out the back window. I'm not telling a lie when I tell you what I'm about to say. I saw a man in my backyard, and he was trying to rape this young girl. That's what it looked like. Jesus, was all Sam could think to say. So I grabbed my bowie knife off the top of the fridge and ran out the back. When I got there, they were gone. They just vanished. Maybe he ran and the girl... No, that's not what happened! Martin yelled, causing the few others in the bar to look over. They were gone! Both of them! They just disappeared! I don't know what to do! He was now standing up and leaning over the bar. Sam had owned bars long enough to see when someone was touching the line of becoming violent. He debated on grabbing the bat from under the bar, but decided against it. Martin had been coming to the bar for five years, and... He'd never had any issues with him. He raised his hands and slowly walked around the bar. Martin, buddy, let's go out and get some air. Maybe someone can get you home. No! Martin yelled and pulled away. I'm not going back there. I don't want to hear that bastard raping that girl anymore. I won't go back there again! Sam opened his mouth to offer an alternative, but Martin had spun around and faced Sam. He saw a brief silver glint before feeling a sudden cold pain in his stomach. Sam took in a sharp gasp of air and could hear the others in the bar knocking over chairs and stools. Sam then felt like he was pissing himself. He looked down and just below the handle of the knife, His pants were becoming soaked in blood. Sam looked at Martin just as two men grabbed him and pulled him outside. He could hear someone yell for someone else to call 911. He then felt hands grab him just as he started to fall back. As he was laid back on the floor of the bar, Sam marveled at how he didn't feel any pain. He lifted his head and could see the wooden handle of the knife protruding from his body. He could feel a soft wave of cold grow outward from the handle. He looked up at the ceiling and saw a brown stain on one of the tiles. I should get that replaced before it molds, 
he thought, just before he lost consciousness. When he woke, he was staring at much cleaner ceiling tiles. He looked around and saw he was in a hospital room. He didn't know where exactly he was, but was glad he was alive. He smiled and scanned the room. His smile faded when he saw a warden standing at the foot of his bed, his hands clasped together as they were before. Do you see now? Do you understand? What do you want? Sam asked with a tone of desperation. Martin Bolan hung himself last night in his cell. Sam closed his eyes and looked away. Warden walked around the bed and pulled a chair up to the side. He sat down, reached out and took Sam's hand. Warden leaned closer and Sam could smell flowers coming from this man in the dark suit. I can't help you, Sam said. I can't be what you want. The knife, it caught something. I'm probably going to be shitting in the bag the rest of my life. I can help you, Warden uh, said, leaning closer. I want to help you. Make me a promise. And I will. Warden then pressed both hands just over the knife wound. What do you want? Warden lifted from the seat and leaned close to Sam's ear. Sam could smell the strange floral scent even stronger than before. Will you do it? Will you be the gravesman? Sam closed his eyes and with a struggling gasp said, <sighs> Yes. The Gravesman by Joe Palumbo If you seek more from this author, his Twitter handle is available on the Featured Authors section of our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au, where you'll find information on all the authors we feature here on the podcast. We do hope you can join us next episode, when we'll be... Getting to know the neighbors. So, I knocked on his door and he answered wearing a bathrobe, which is, I guess, what he wears when he's home. I asked if we could talk in private, indicating I wanted to come in, but he shooed me back, not wanting me to come inside. The door was only open a crack. You're a giant spider, I whispered. It's, like, really obvious, too. He stared at me for a moment, then invited me into his place. I wish I hadn't gone in. I wish I'd kept my stupid mouth shut. Tune in, as it were, in a fortnight for Jack Afon Reese's my neighbor's just a giant spider in a trench coat. All voices in production are concocted by Kristen Holland. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. Until next time, as always, watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone. Especially yourself. Good night, gentle listener.